Let's uh, take our Bibles and open them to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, and take a look uh, at verses uh, 63 through 65. And I think it's been about a month, hasn't it, since we met? So some of y'all may not may not remember what we've been studying. There's a hint on the screen. The coming kingdom. Kind of using a book that I wrote as a topical study, but the important thing is not my book, it's God's book. So my book just topically organizes some data. But uh, what we've been trying to get at is the whole subject of the kingdom. And we're now in uh, chapter 12. So we're trying to get at this point here. What does the Bible say about the kingdom? And it's sort of a dirty trick I, I pulled on everybody. I knew if we started to answer what the Bible says about the kingdom, we'd have to study the whole Bible. So I could have just said, let's study the whole Bible, or I could do a stealth maneuver and say we're going to study the kingdom. Because probably the if you don't understand the kingdom, you really can't understand the big picture of the Bible. So uh, I know there's a lot of cobwebs, and uh, it's been a, a month since we've been at this. So let me just sort of uh, review where we've been, if I could. The story of the kingdom starts there in the Garden of Eden, where God was ruling through a man and a woman, and they were governing creation for God. And that's really the establishment of the kingdom on earth, that arrangement. So you know the story from Genesis 3. They stopped listening to God and started listening to what they were supposed to be ruling over. The animals, in particular a talking snake. And they rebelled against God in the process. And so once that happened, the kingdom was lost to the earth. So the story of the Bible is how the kingdom is restored to the earth. And so you start to see through the Abrahamic covenant the covenant that God entered into with Abraham, uh, a plan is in motion through a nation to bring forth a king and a kingdom to the world. And the Abrahamic covenant gave the nation of Israel ownership over three things. Anybody remember what those three things are? Land, seed, and blessing. So that happens about 2000 B.C., And then you kind of move forward another 600 years to about 1446 B.C., about a year after the Exodus, and God gives to the nation of Israel another covenant called the Mosaic Covenant, which, unlike the Abrahamic Covenant, is a conditional covenant. So the Mosaic Covenant gives to Israel not ownership, they already had that, but what? Anybody recall? Possession or what? Enjoyment. So in order for the nation to possess or enjoy what they already own, they have to comply with the Mosaic Covenant. And who does the Mosaic Covenant point to ultimately? Jesus. And we move from there into the divided kingdom, the north and the south. Just after the time of Solomon, the kingdom was divided, the nation was divided. And of the two, what's the more important? The south, because there's a prophecy given to Judah, found in Genesis 49, verse 10, that through Judah is going to come this king, and ultimately this kingdom. And then we got down there to number five, where something called the times of the Gentiles started. And uh, the nation of Israel got so bad that they were evicted out of their land. And so, as you know from Sunday mornings in Daniel, a new time period started around the 6th century called the Times of the Gentiles, 
where Israel would not have a king reigning on David's throne. And that started with uh, the Babylonian captivity. And as we've studied in the book of Daniel, that's going to go all the way until the second advent of Christ. So until the second advent of Christ takes place, um, you're not going to have the kingdom coming to the earth. And that took us to number six, where the prophets during this time of kingdom postponement sketch a beautiful picture of what the kingdom is going to be like. So the prophets, you know, sort of are functioning as a light shining in a dark place, as Peter says. Uh, During this time when the kingdom is absent, what it's going to be like one day. And then the nation of Israel comes out of the 70-year captivity under the Persians. They go back into their land. Uh, the, The Persian Empire governing Israel is replaced by Greece. Greece is replaced by Rome. And during the time period of the Roman Empire, who shows up offering Israel their kingdom? Jesus Christ. And that is what is called the offer of the kingdom where Jesus and John and the disciples said, repent, for the kingdom of God is what? It's at hand. So had Israel, back in the first century, enthroned Christ, hypothetically, the the long-awaited kingdom could have come. So we sort of went into that concept and explained it. But then you get down there to number nine, and the tragedy is, what did Israel do with their king? and the offer of the kingdom. They did what with it? Rejected it. And does anybody recall what chapter of the Bible that took place in? Matthew 12. So Matthew 12 is the hinge. And once that happens, the offer is withdrawn, and the kingdom continues in postponement. But God never leaves the earth without a witness of himself, right? So we're living, as we have been for the last 2,000 years, in a time period where the kingdom's not here. It's not going to come until the tribulation period and Israel finally receives the offer of the kingdom. Uh, As long as Israel has not received their king, they remain the owner of her blessings, but not the what? Possessor, and the kingdom remains not canceled, but what? Postponed. So that's the time period that we're, we've been in for 2,000 years. But that doesn't mean God is not working just because the kingdom's not here. So what you start to get information about is an interim period of time where God is doing certain things. And those things include the kingdom mysteries and also the church. So we looked at the kingdom parables. There's eight of them. And Jesus, in these eight parables, given in Matthew 13, by the way, Matthew 13 follows Matthew 12. That's, that's very logical. Because 12 is the rejection of the offer of the kingdom. 13 is the consequences. So he explains very clearly in eight parables what, what, what the world is going to be like uh, when the ki- while the kingdom is not here. And so we worked our way all the way through those eight parables And then the second thing to understand to grasp the inner Advent age is the birth of the what? The church. So the church age has been going on for the last 2,000 years. We've explained all about the church age. And probably the thing to understand is that the church, as wonderful as it is, is not Israel and is not the kingdom, right? So God is clearly doing a work in the, in the church, this new man, this new spiritual man, but it shouldn't be confused with what he's promised to bring to the earth one day through the kingdom. So that, in a nutshell, sort of catches you up with uh, everything we've covered. You know, it took, took about 30 lessons for us to get here, but uh, we made it safely. 
And what we're going to start moving into now is what in the world is God going to do once he's finished with the church? Because one of these days, the earthly mission of the church will be over. The church will be taken to heaven through which event? The rapture. And after the rapture takes place, God does not leave the earth without a witness of himself, right? So he's still going to work. The question is, how's he going to work and how's he going to bring the kingdom to the earth? So we're finished talking about the, what God is doing in the present. And now we're shifting to what God is doing after the church is gone. And God's uh, program revolves around, his kingdom program revolves around the nation of Israel. So at Mount Sinai, it says this, God says this, now if you, now the you there is Israel, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among the peoples of the earth, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a what? kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall, you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So you see there the if-then clause. If Israel does this, then the kingdom will come. So as long as Israel hasn't complied with the if clause, and by the way, the if clause points to who? Jesus Christ. As long as they haven't complied with the if clause, the kingdom remains in a state of postponement. So the, really the goal of history is how is God going to get Israel into, into compliance so the kingdom can come. And this was uh, the thing that Jesus was talking about just prior to his death during the Passion Week. He made this statement at the end of Matthew 23. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, who is he talking to there? Israel or the church? Israel. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is uh, really a citation from Psalm 118, verse 26, which is a messianic psalm. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm not coming back for this nation to establish my kingdom through this nation until you acknowledge me as your Messiah. See that? So the whole kingdom program following the rapture of the church and how the kingdom ultimately comes to the earth, it all revolves around God's program for Israel. You see that? So that means we need to study Israel. So our study of Israel has five parts to it. Number one, we have Israel in the diaspora. I'll explain what that means in a second. Number two, you have Israel's regathering in unbelief. And I believe we're seeing that happen today. Uh, And that kind of shows us what time in history we're living in. Number three, you have Israel's conversion through distress predicted. See, distress is what God is going to use to bring Israel to himself. And then finally, number four, there'll be Israel's final restoration. And unless you understand what God is doing, has done, is doing, will do through Israel, you can't really understand how and under what circumstances he brings his kingdom to the earth. See that? So Israel to God is a big deal because she is the nation that has been given the covenants. So let's start with Israel in the diaspora first. What does diaspora mean? Diaspora is a Greek word that just means dispersion. Uh, Israel in what we would call worldwide um, dispersion. 
So the nation of Israel in the first century, as you know, rejected Jesus Christ. Uh, In fact, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years in advance, predicted this would happen. Isaiah 53. Daniel, the prophet in Daniel 9, verse 26, predicted this would happen 600 years in advance. It says the Messiah would be cut off, rejected by its own nation. And one of the things to understand is God when he brought the nation of Israel to Mount Sinai and gave them the Mosaic Covenant. And here's another picture there of of Sinai. They're leaving Egypt. They go there to the uh, tip of the Sinai Peninsula, which is the traditional view of where Mount Sinai is. Some disagree and and put Mount Sinai elsewhere, elsewhere. And Uh, that's really not my point to get into that debate of where Mount Sinai is. But the point is God brought them to Mount Sinai and he gave them the Mosaic Covenant. And the Mosaic Covenant has a lot of different aspects to it, including, and this is why I had you open to Deuteronomy 28, cycles of blessing and curses. And we've studied this. If Israel disobeys the covenant, she will be materially and physically cursed by God. If Israel obeys the covenant, she will be materially and physically blessed by God. And you see all that laid out very clearly in Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 14 are the blessings for obedience. Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68 is the curses for disobedience. By the way, did you notice there's only 14 verses for obedience here? And the rest of the chapter is all curses for disobedience. It's almost like God knew what would happen, right? (laughs) And one of the things that God said is if you disobey me, take a look now at Deuteronomy 28 verses 49 and 50. At the height of Israel's disobedience, God predicted what would happen. The Lord, verse 49, will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who will have no respect for the old, nor show favor to the young. So what is predicted is at the height of disobedience, God is going to bring a pagan power, speaking a foreign language. He's going to bring that foreign power against the nation of Israel. That foreign power is going to be his his instrument of disobedience. And that foreign power is going to push Israel out of her land. So God announced that this would happen and 700 years pass and God starts to make good on his promises because of the perpetual disobedience of the nation of Israel. You study the life of Solomon, for example, the third king of the United Kingdom. And it's almost like Solomon woke up one day and read Deuteronomy 28 and decided to do the opposite. So uh, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 17 says the king is not to multiply wealth for himself. So what did Solomon do? He multiplied wealth for himself. The king is not to take on multiple wives. What did Solomon do? Took on multiple wives. Uh, The man had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And that's basically how you entered into a treaty with a foreign nation. The king gave you, you know, a princess as part of the treaty deal. And the fact that Solomon's got 700 wives shows you how many treaties he entered into. And by the way, the book of Deuteronomy also says don't enter into treaties with foreign nations. So you can see Solomon flagrantly violated that. I mean, you can't get a more disobedient guy in the final 40 years of his life than Solomon. So, uh, what did God do? What did God say he would do in Deuteronomy 28, 700 years earlier? 
He said, I'll bring discipline. So discipline happened after Solomon left the throne and the kingdom was divided between the north and the south. The ten tribes in the north continued into disobedience. And so what did God do? He brought the cycles of discipline again and scattered the north. And the rod of his discipline was the Assyrians. So God said, I'm going to bring a nation against you whose language you don't understand. And so this time he used the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Scattered the northern kingdom. You can read about that in 2 Kings 17. You can read about the division of the northern and the southern kingdom within the land of Israel in 1 Kings 12. Now, you would think that the two little tribes that remained, anybody know the tribes that remained in the south? Judah, what was the other one? Benjamin. You would think they would learn their lesson, you know, and say, well, the north got in trouble when they disobeyed God, so we're going to get our act together. Well, when you get into the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel uh, describes these two kingdoms, north and south, as two sisters that are harlot, harlots, basically. The older sister is named Ohola, and the younger sister is named uh, Oholabah, if I've got those names right. The older sister represents, in Ezekiel 23, Ezekiel explains this, the northern kingdom, And the younger sister represents the southern kingdom that remained. And Ezekiel's whole point in Ezekiel 23 is the younger sister should have learned what happened to the discipline God brought on the older sister because of her harlotry. But the younger sister actually became worse of a harlot than the older sister. And Ezekiel makes that statement as to how God's hand cannot be withheld. And God has to make good on his promises and he has to bring discipline. And consequently, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom had already been scattered by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom is taken into captivity. And this time, God is not using the Assyrians to discipline the south as he did the north, but he's using who? Anybody know? Babylonians. So the Babylonians come under Nebuchadnezzar remove the nation of Israel from her homeland and take her into captivity. And that's where the story of the prophet Daniel that we're studying on Sunday mornings picks up at that point. And you know the story from the Bible, how they went back into the land after the 70 years of discipline were over. And Jesus shows up and they mistreat him and they reject him. And so God now, based on Deuteronomy 28, verses 49 through 50, is going to make good on his promises once again, and he's going to push the nation of Israel out of her land. And this time he's not using the Assyrians or the Babylonians, but he's using who? The Romans. So that is discipline that God brought against his own nation about 40 years or so after Christ left the earth. So Christ left the earth. uh, First the nation rejected him. Uh, They turned him over to the Romans for execution. God actually turned lemons into lemonade. Because through that transaction, whose sin debt was paid for? Ours, the whole world. Anybody that trusts in that provision. But God has to make good on what he said at Sinai. Deuteronomy 28, 49 and 50. So this time he brought the Romans against the nation of Israel. This is what Jesus is predicting What happened about four decades later in the events of A.D. 70, you'll see Jesus' predictions there in Luke 19, verses 41 through 44. And at that point, the nation of Israel is pushed into what we call the diaspora. Worldwide dispersion. And they have been in that state of worldwide dispersion for 2,000 years. And that's really how to look at the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, as I speak today, is under the discipline of God. You know, I I love Israel. I think we should do whatever we can do to help Israel. 
But the reality is the nation of Israel for the last 2,000 years has been under the disciplinary hand of God, pushed into worldwide dispersion, an outworking of the cycles of discipline spelled out at Mount Sinai. And you'll notice that Moses, all the way back at Mount Sinai, predicted this would happen. In Deuteronomy 4, verse 27, it says this, The Lord will scatter you among the what? The peoples. You will be left few in number among the what? Nations. That's diaspora language. You know, you're going to be scattered into the nations. And that really didn't happen uh, the way Moses predicted it would happen until when? A.D. 70. And now we're finally getting to the verse I had you open up to, Deuteronomy 28, 63 through 65. Another diaspora prophecy. It will come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you and to multiply you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you. You will be torn from the land which you are entering to possess. Now they entered under Joshua. And uh, they were in that land for about 1,300 years. They were out of it for the captivity of 70 years in Babylon, but they came back. And Moses is predicting that although you're going to be in that land for a long time, 1,300 years to be exact, eventually you're going to be kicked out of that land again. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among the, what? Peoples, is that sing, is peoples there singular or plural? Plural. It's not talking about them being located in, into one nation for discipline, as was the case in Babylon. It's talking about their global dispersion. The Lord will scatter you among all peoples from the end of the earth to the to the other end of the earth. See, see the diaspora language there? Global dispersion. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone which you or your fathers have not known. Among those nations, plural, see that? You shall find no rest. There shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, uh, let's see, failing of eyes and a despair of soul. And I can't think of a better description of what the nation of Israel has endured for 2,000 years than what you find there in those verses, Deuteronomy 28, verses 63 through 65. When you look at the language when it says peoples and nations, this cannot be the the captivity in Babylon. Because the captivity in Babylon was just to one nation. They were there 70 years. Then they returned from their captivity. What Deuteronomy 28 is predicting is something far worse than what happened to them in Babylon. It's them being evicted into their land and being in global dispersion, worldwide dispersion, for a prolonged period of time. And that dispersion, in my humble opinion, really did not start until 40 years after the time of Christ in the events of A.D. 70. And that is the condition the nation of Israel has been in for 2,000 years. So to understand Israel, the first thing you have to understand is Israel in the diaspora, Israel in the dispersion. To understand how God is going to bring his kingdom to the earth, which is all, as I've tried to explain, revolving around the nation of Israel, you have to understand how God has dealt with great severity against Israel and pushed them into the diaspora. And you say, well, this is all very depressing. Well, let me kind of uh, give you a happy thought. Can I do that? You're saying, please give us a happy thought. Deuteronomy 30 verse 3 doesn't just predict the scattering, but it predicts their ultimate what? 
regathering, and restoration. Now, here's my happy thought of the day. Do you think the scattering happened very literally? Yes, it did. That's the obvious record of history. Well, if the scattering happened very literally, then the prophecies about Israel's what must be literal as well. Her regathering. See that? So when you see how accurately God has made good on what he said he would do through the scattering, and you say, wow, God really means what he says, then you have to take also at face value and literally the prophecies of regathering. So Deuteronomy 30 verse 3 says the Lord will restore you from captivity, have compassion on you, and will gather you again from where? From Babylon? No. From all the peoples of the earth. See that? Where the Lord God has scattered you. Now there are many, many Christian churches, many, many Christian pastors, many, many Christian theologians, many, many Christian denominations that will not breathe a single word about this to you in sermons or Bible studies. Why is that? Because they really don't believe what it says. And what they will do is they will say, the prophecies there of Israel's scattering are literal. But the prophecies of Israel's regathering and restoration are allegorical. You see that? And that is a doctrine called amillennialism or replacement theology or kingdom now theology where they're basically trying to argue that all of the prophecies regarding Israel's restoration are happening today in your local church. Jesus is reigning in your heart. You know, that that kind of thing. So you see what they have to do here. They've got to take one half of the verse literally, the scattering, And the other half of the verse allegorically. Now, does that make any real sense logically? Uh, I don't think the Holy Spirit is going to switch horses in midstream. I mean, if God said the scattering is literal of a literal nation, the Hebrew nation, then their regathering has to be literal as well. So when you see how severely God has treated Israel, his wife, Israel is the wife of Jehovah, Isaiah 54 and verse 5 says that. Uh, it, it's kind of it's easy to get kind of depressed about it, but then you start to, to say, wait a minute, if God did everything he said he would do concerning her scattering, then I have to also take at face value her regathering. And as Christians, we have to pay attention to the prophecies related to Israel's regathering because the whole uh, manifestation of the coming of the kingdom to planet earth revolves around God's program for Israel. You see that? I mean, that's why Israel is a big deal. So we've seen Israel in the diaspora. But then the prophecies go on and they begin to talk about her regathering in unbelief. See, if you look at my outline here, there's basically two regatherings. First, Israel is going to be regathered in unbelief. And then as she goes through the events of the tribulation period and the persecution of the Antichrist, she's going to be regathered in faith. Now, this chart here from uh, Dr. Randall Price, who we've had as a speaker before at this church, I think you have it there in your notes, is one of the best charts explaining the two regatherings. Because a lot of people today are very confused as to what God is doing. God is regathering the nation of Israel today. He started that process. Well, it really culminated and continues with their war of independence, May the 14th, 1948. And this is sort of a um, thorn in the side of a lot of people because they say, well, how could that be the plan and program of God Israel today is an unbelieving nation. I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu, the leader of the nation of Israel, is not an evangelical Christian, right? In fact, that nation is primarily atheistic. 
And so people say, well, how could that regathering, how could that group of unbelievers in the Middle East be significant? After all, they're not Christians. And the answer is you've got to understand that the regathering process has two parts to it. First, he's got to regather them in unbelief before he regathers them in faith. Do you see that? Guess what you have to be before you can be a believer? Anybody know the answer to that? Before you can be a believer, you have to be an unbeliever. Now, let me just ask you a basic question. Do you think God was at work in your life before you were a believer? I mean, I can look back at my life and I could very clearly see the work of God. At the time, I didn't know it. But God was, you know, setting up the right conversations and allowing me to meet the right people and, you know, uh, experience some failures and some emptiness and things where my heart was sort of searching. See, that's all the, that's all the plan and program of God. In fact, Jesus in John 16, verses 7 through 11, where he says the Spirit has come into the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's a description of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the unbeliever. So if God can work in my life as an unbeliever and bring me to faith, why can't he do that with Israel? See that? And that's, that's how to understand the current regathering of Israel in unbelief as still the work of God. You with me on that? So this chart here shows you the difference between the two. We have Israel's two regatherings. We have the present first regathering. And that is to be compared to the permanent second regathering. In the present regathering, Israel returns to part of her land. Today, Israel, I may have a chart in here somewhere. I might have to fast forward to find it. Uh, I don't think that's the one I wanted. Of course, the chart I'm thinking of is at the very end, right? There, that's the one I'm looking for. See that dark blue area there? That's basically what Israel possesses today. Do you see that lighter blue area? That's everything that God has promised to Israel. So in the first regathering, she returns to part of her land. In the second regathering, she's going to return to the whole land. And she's going to get everything that God promised to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant. A plot of real estate that goes from modern day Egypt uh, to modern day Iraq. So, backing up again, back to our chart. In the present regathering, Israel returns in unbelief. But in the second regathering, at the end of the tribulation period, she returns in faith. And if you look at Matthew 24, verse 31... Uh, it makes this statement here, Matthew 24, 31. It says, He will send forth His angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. That is a description of God regathering His nation in context the nation of Israel after they've been persecuted from the Antichrist. So this is their regathering in faith. So in the first regathering, she goes back to her land in unbelief. In the second regathering, she returns in faith. In the first regathering, she's restored to the land only. In the second regathering, she's restored to the land and the what? The Lord. So in the second regathering, she comes back into her own land as a believer, regenerated, just as real as you're regenerated today. The first regathering, and I believe that the regathering is happening right now, 
is setting the stage for the tribulation period. It's setting the stage for discipline. See, it's through this distress or discipline that she'll get saved. See that? But the second regathering is going to set the stage for the millennial kingdom. And it will set the stage not for discipline, but for what? Blessing. So you see what's happening here? We're living in between those two regatherings. The regathering in unbelief is already happening. And by the way, this regathering in unbelief is a sociological miracle. How do I know that? Because when a nation is removed from its homeland, within a couple generations, that nation assimilates into its host culture. So the reality of the situation is there shouldn't be Jewish people today. There shouldn't be a group of people called the Hebrews. Uh, How do I know that? Because the Bible talks about the Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites, the Mesquitabites, the Termites, the Out of Sights, the Electric Lights. I mean, how many... um, how many Amalekites do you know? Do you know any Amalekites? How many Jebusites do you know? I mean, they're in the Bible. I mean, when a neighbor moves in down the street, we don't say, oh, what a lovely uh, Jebusite couple down the road. There are no Jebusites. Why? Because sociologically, they were removed from their land and they assimilated into the host culture. They lost their ethnicity. So sociologists tell us within two to three generations that happens. Now, how do you explain Israel being out of its land in worldwide dispersion, not for two or three generations, but for 2,000 years? How do you explain that? And then they go right back into the same land that they were evicted from 2,000 years later, speaking the same language, Hebrew. Um and the same religion, and the same culture. And people say, oh, I wish God would do some miracles today. I mean, are you kidding me? If you look at the nation of Israel in the Middle East, that's a sociological miracle. That's the best example I can think of of a modern-day miracle today. Uh, And God said this would happen. You're going to go into dispersion, and yet he can't bring them back unless they're preserved. So through all these years and all this persecution, they've been preserved and God recycles them back into the same land that they were initially evicted from. So that's where we are today. And that's why I believe that the church age is rapidly coming to an end. I'm not a date setter, but the reality of the situation is God is building the temple and basically what's happening right now is he's putting on the roof. It won't be much longer until the church age is over because we see signs of it, rumblings of of it in the Middle East. God is getting ready to turn his hand back on the nation of Israel and their regathering in unbelief is evidence of that. So there are many, many prophecies in the Bible that reveal that God is going to regather his people in unbelief. One of them is in Ezekiel 20, verses 33 through 38. You might want to look at that. It says this, As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, And with my wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. Look at this. I will bring you from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are what? Scattered. What's our Greek word for scattered? Diaspora. With a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with my wrath poured out, I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. See that there? They've been regathered in unbelief, awaiting his judgment. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Look at this. I will purge from you the rebels and those that have transgressed against me. 
See what he's doing? He's bringing them back in unbelief for discipline. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. Now, take a look at Isaiah 11, verses 11 and 12. This one is very interesting. It says this, Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the which time? Second time with his hand. Isn't that interesting? Gives a number there. The remnant of his people will remain. From Assyria, Egypt, Pothros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath. Those are all the nations where Israel has been scattered. And from the islands of the sea, he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed from the four corners of the earth. Now, in context... This is talking about the regathering in faith at the end of the tribulation period. Well, if that is the second regathering, let me ask you a question. And it says the second time. When was the first one? People say, well, that's Israel being brought back from Babylon. Well, uh, that dog won't hunt. Because when they were brought back from Babylon, they weren't back, brought back from the whole world. They were brought back from one locality. See that? So what he is saying here, Isaiah is, is there is going to be a regathering in faith which will be preceded by a worldwide regathering in unbelief. So what are we seeing today? We are seeing the first of the two. There is a regathering in unbelief. That's the first one. Then in the events of the tribulation period, she is scattered again, and then there'll be a regathering in faith. And I get that because it says there the second time. Are you with me on that? You say, well, pastor, you're crazy. Why do you talk like this? So let me quote someone that knows more about it than I do. Uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, the great Hebrew Christian scholar. He's making a statement here about Isaiah 11, verses 11 and 12. Because people will say this, oh, 1948, who cares? They can get scattered again. And if they get scattered again, God will bring them back again in unbelief. So they don't believe there's any prophetic significance to what's happening in the Middle East today. Well, once again, that dog won't hunt because Isaiah says the second time. If there's a second regathering from around the world, there has to be a what? First regathering from around the world. See, Isaiah 11, 11, and 12 refutes this mindset that's so common among Christians that Israel in the land today doesn't mean anything. So Arnold Fruchtenbaum explains it this way. But then the view goes on to say that we really can't be sure that the present Jewish state, as we see it today, is the fulfillment of those prophecies that spoke of the regathering and unbelief. Why not? Because they believe that it's possible to have several regatherings in unbelief before there is the specific one that fulfills the prophecies just discussed. But this passage in Isaiah, the one we just read, shows that it is ex- that is exactly what cannot be. There cannot be several regatherings in unbelief from the four corners of the earth. The entire context of Isaiah 11 and 12. This is the entire context of Isaiah 11 and 12. In this context, he, that's Isaiah, is speaking of a final worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for blessing. Isaiah numbers the final worldwide regathering in faith in preparation for the messianic kingdom as the second one. You see that? In other words, the last one is only the second one. 
if the last one is the second one, how many can there be before that? Only one, right? The first one could not have been the return from Babylon since that was not an international regathering from the four corners of the world. Only a migration from one country, Babylonia, to another, Judea. The Bible does not allow for several worldwide regatherings in unbelief. It allows for one worldwide regathering in unbelief, followed by the last one, the one in faith, which is the second one. This text only permits two worldwide regatherings from the four corners of the earth. Therefore, the present Jewish state is relevant to Bible prophecy. Uh, I can't tell you how long I've heard from people that, well, we don't, we don't really know what it is. We can't be sure. Let's, uh, you know, let's, let's sort of uh, pause and, and make sure we're calm and cool and collected before we can categorically say that what God is doing in the Middle East today is prophetically significant. There is so much um, what I would call prophetic agnosticism in the average evangelical mind today. People just will not take a stand uh, on these kinds of subjects and a host of other subjects for that matter. Well, I, I'm taking a stand on it. I'm not giving you a date and I'm not giving you a time. What I'm saying is this. What is happening in the Middle East today is a big, big deal. And you shouldn't take it lightly as a Christian. It is a sign from God And something like this has never happened before. It is a sign from God that God is saying, I'm about to bring my kingdom to the earth. I've got to convert Israel first. So therefore, I've got to finish up the work of the church. I've got to get the church out of here. I've got to take the church to heaven via the rapture so I can finish what I said I would start or complete all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy Uh, chapter 28. So as a Christian, you need to understand something. You are living on borrowed time. If you understand these prophecies correctly, you may not live out your full life expectancy. Uh, I may not live out my full life expectancy. Now, then again, maybe we will. I can't set a date. I can only know the general season that we're in. So here you say, well, this is all a bunch of uh, academic stuff. Give me some application. Well, here's the application. If you're committing some kind of sin in your life right now, you better knock it off. How's that for application? Because you're going to stand before the Lord at the beam of seat judgment and give an account in terms of rewards, not salvation, but rewards. Here's another application. If God is putting on your heart to do a ministry you better do it right now. You better, not, you better not presume, you know, James says we commit the sin of presumption. We say, well, tomorrow I'll, I'll do this and I'll go into this city over here and I'll start a business. And James says, you don't even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. We don't even know if the church is going to be here tomorrow. So if God is calling you to do a ministry, now is the time to do it. If God is calling you to share your faith with somebody, a neighbor, a coworker, or family member, or whatever, you shouldn't say, well, I'll just do it next year. You should do it right now. And every time you look into the Middle East and you see the Israeli flag flying there, and you see the Hebrew language being spoken... Uh, That is a testimony that this age is is getting ready to wrap up. That's what that's what God is communicating through these things. And so we have to we're so lackadaisical with our Christianity. There's almost in the American church today, there's there's such a lack of urgency to what we're doing. A lot of times we're just kind of going through the motions. And when you start to understand these prophecies, it what it introduces is immediate urgency you know, into the life of the Christian. I mean, when they figured out the Titanic was sinking, they didn't waste their time rearranging the deck chairs. I mean, this is serious now. We've got to get people, we got to get people off this boat. And so what I'm trying to say is the Titanic is sinking. Uh, 
Now, there's hope because there's a new world coming, but this world is about to move into strenuous judgment after the rapture. And you may not have a lot of time left to warn people and get them saved so they can go up in the rapture, you see. I mean, think about this for a second. Rome in AD 70 kicks Israel out of her land. Rome, a worldwide power speaking Latin, kicks Israel out of her land. That's AD 70. Flash forward 2,000 years. Rome is gone. Latin is a dead language. What remains? Tiny Israel and Hebrew is a what? A live language. That's the hand of God. Um, Of course, you know from our studies in the book of Daniel on Sunday morning that what will start the tribulation period is the Antichrist entering into a peace treaty with unbelieving Israel, right? Daniel 9.27. Can I ask a basic question? How can that happen unless you have a what? Unbelieving Israel in existence. Well, we haven't had that for 2,000 years. Oh, boom, in our lifetime, there it is. God is setting the stage for the tribulation period. It's what's, it's what's happening. Uh, there's a lot of prophecies that Israel has to fulfill while she's in unbelief. Therefore, she's got to be regathered in what? Unbelief. Have you read Revelation 11, verse 8 lately? It's in the tribulation. It says their bodies, that's the two witnesses, will lie in the street of the great city, which is mystically called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? Which city? Jerusalem. He's talking about Jerusalem. And he says, at that time, Jerusalem will be like Sodom, known for depravity, right? And Egypt, known for bondage. You can't have a prophecy like that unless Israel is regathered in unbelief. Uh, Look, Have you studied uh, Zechariah 12 and verse 10 lately? I will pour out on the house of David... And on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Spirit, the Spirit is the Holy Spirit, it's their conversion, the Spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This is the conversion of Israel. Now watch this very carefully. Before the Spirit comes upon them, where is their geographical location? The Spirit comes upon them while they are inhabitants of Jerusalem. So they're in Jerusalem in unbelief. Then the Spirit comes. Well, I got a little question. How do they get how do they get there in unbelief? There has to be two regatherings. See that? A regathering in unbelief, which paves the way for the regathering in faith. Um, You say, well, Pastor, I still think you're crazy. That's all right. A lot of people do. That's why I like to quote people that know more about this than me. Uh, Longtime prophecy scholar. John Walvoord said of the many peculiar phenomenon which characterize the present generation, few events can claim equal significance as far as biblical prophecy is concerned with that of the return of Israel to their land. It constitutes preparation for the end of the age, the setting of the stage for the coming of the church, and the fulfillment of Israel's prophetic destiny. That's exactly what I'm saying right here, isn't it? I'm not making stuff up. I mean, all I'm doing is carrying forward a tradition that's been handed to me. And these older guys, they got it from the Bible. Do you know when John Walvoord made that statement? He made it in 1962. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, Israel didn't even get Jordan and uh, Samaria 
and Judea back until 1967. When Walford made that statement, the nation of Israel didn't even have political control over the city of Jerusalem. 1962. And could you imagine his excitement when Israel gets control in what's called the Six-Day War over the city of Jerusalem? Once they get control over the city of Jerusalem, suddenly the Jews in Jerusalem, where they have to be before the Spirit comes upon them, suddenly that prophecy starts to make sense. Uh, The world calls that the West Bank, but it's better called the Judea and Samaria. So it's a uh, territory that Israel got in a war of self-defense called the Six-Day War. So, um, <clears throat> well, one quick thing. By the way, on, on, in my book, pages 160 to 162, I've got three other quotes from Walward where he says that, says things like that in 1962. I've just given you one quote. Um, and people say, well, you know, If you listen to John Piper, for example, you know, I call him the Pied Piper. He's very popular amongst the youth, kind of a motivational speaker type of guy. And he's always saying, you know, Israel in the land today doesn't mean anything. Why is that? Because Israel is in unbelief. So if Israel is in unbelief, she has no right to that land. That's his logic. Well, newsflash, Israel was in that land from the time of Joshua up to the time of Christ for 1,300 years. Have you read your Old Testament carefully? Were they ever in belief? I mean, they were, they were characterized by unbelief. So if you say that Israel has to be in belief before she has any right to the land, then you've got to throw out 1,300 years of biblical history. And people like John Piper do not acknowledge that God can work with a people in unbelief before they're brought to conversion. And, And that's what we're seeing happening in our day. So we've looked at Israel and diaspora. Israel's regathering in unbelief. Then you say, well, once they're regathered in unbelief, how's God going to save them? And so next week we'll talk about that, how God is going to save them through distress. And this is important to understand because God's work through Israel is the mechanism that he's going to use to bring the long-awaited kingdom to the earth. Okay, not too bad tonight, 802, only went over two minutes. So I will stop, and if you guys have to take off to pick up your kids or just take off in general, you can do that. And those that want to stick around and ask a question, a few questions, we can do that as well. 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 That as well. That as well. That.